This morning we're going to begin with our brief scripture, a scripture I've preached on before, a scripture that uh, I really like. This is coming from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, 18 and 19. That's where we're going to begin. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And then skipping over to verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Before I was an ordained minister, I was a licensed minister. And in the Disciples of Christ Church, you can, be, you can be a lay licensed minister for a specific church, for a specific duty. A licensed minister can't go from church to church. They have to be licensed for each church they preach at or each church they work at. So I was a licensed minister at my home church. And as a licensed minister, I had to go before the commissioning uh, board every year for reevaluation and relicensing. And that required me to fill out a ton of paperwork, including listing books that I've read throughout the year and things like that. So I remember it was probably my third, third or fourth time uh, meeting with the uh, ministry commission. And so, you know, being a young licensed minister and being here before, I was a little cocky. I was you know, I was routine, no big deal. And when I filled out the paperwork and I got to the part about books read, well, I hadn't read a lot of books that year, but I knew that the, the region had just endorsed um, a book called um, Natural Church Development. And it was a, a book that they were hoping other churches would adopt and use uh, in their own churches. And so I thought, well, you know, I own the book. Now, I did own it, and I had skimmed through it, but I hadn't read it. And I thought, well, I'm going to get a few brownie points here, and I put that book on my paper. So I went before the commission board, and everything was going great, as usual. But then we got to a point where the chairperson says, well, it says here, he says, that uh, you've read Natural Church Development. Yeah, that's really, that's great. I'm glad you, so, so what do you think is your church's weakest stave? <laughs> what? What? Stave. Boy, I, I, I can imagine what my face looked like in that moment. I had no idea what he was, what is a stave? What is he talking about? And one of the other ministers must have seen the panic look in my face because he jumps in and says, yeah, Kurt, you know, evangelism, youth ministry, uh, stewardship, which one of those things do you think your church needs to work on most? And so me, trying to recover, acting like I've been thinking about it the whole time, oh yeah, yeah, evangelism. I think that's the one that we need to work on most. And if you read the book, I said, well, that's what I did. I, I left and I immediately went to find out what a stave was. And the way this book, it, it presents your church life like a barrel. And each barrel has it's made of a plank of wood, and those planks of wood are staves. And the idea is, is you know, your barrel can only hold as much water as your weakest stave will allow it to hold. So whatever your weakest or shortest stave is, that's the stave you work on to, to, to bring up. So I made a vow at that point that I would never put down a book that I had not read. Now, when I got to seminary, I broke that vow. <laughs> in seminary, you had to read 1,500 pages a week, and you just, there's no way you could do that. And you had to pick and choose which classes uh, that week you're going to decide to just kind of let slide. And so I chose to let one of my classes, I think it was some sort of an ethical class, I don't know what class it was. But I remember uh, we were supposed to read a book and write a paper on that book. And so, I just skimmed through the book, all right, let's see, he says this, and I wrote a page on that. I turned the page, read something, wrote a page. I got the paper back a week later, and in the back of the paper, he had all these red marks on this paper. And finally in the back, he said, 
Kurt, did you even read this book? <laughs> Once again, I made a vow that I would never, but I regretted those moments because I think in those moments, in my mind, I thought, well, I just lowered myself in that person's eyes. And I regretted doing those things. And those aren't the only things I regretted. But those are moments that I wish I would have done differently. And I think we've all been in that boat. I think we've all done things that we've regretted. We've said things we wish we hadn't said. Maybe you're going through a moment of regret right now in your life. Something you've done, a choice you've made, you're wishing I hadn't done that. Maybe, maybe you should have taken a job that you didn't take. Maybe you should not have gotten into a relationship that you got into. Maybe you're regretting not finishing school. Maybe you're regretting uh, something you did as a child. I don't know. I don't know. But I think we've all experienced regret. And the question is, is how do you move past those regrets? How do you handle those regrets, those mistakes? Or do they handle you? Do you let those regrets and mistakes define who you are? It'd be great if we could go back in time and fix those mistakes. Jump into that DeLorean from Back to the Future, the TARDIS, Doctor Who, or the, the Hot Tub. You ever heard of that movie, Hot Tub Time Machine? Four guys find themselves in a hot tub and they realize it's a time machine and it takes them back to the 1980s and they begin to meet people that they know in the future and they decide, let's change things. Let's change some of the mistakes we made in high school. And so one guy decides he's going to stand up to the bully that beat him up. And another guy decides he's going to step up and talk to the girl that he had a crush on. It'd be neat if we could all go back in time and change some of those things. You know, I wonder, I wonder what I would do. I mean, think about that. If I could go back, if you could go back to one point in history, in your timeline, what would you do? Where would you go? What point? What, I was thinking about that the other day, and, I, and there's so many points in my life that I would go back to. Uh, studying, maybe I would have studied more instead of moving off. Maybe I would have uh, actually talked to the girl that sat next to me in class. Uh, maybe I would not have played wiffle ball on that Christmas morning when the grass was wet and I fell and tore my ACL. And, uh, that changed my life forever, my leg now forever. But to go back in time and to change those mistakes, fresh starts, second chances. And the good news is, is that God's love empowers us to be able to move past our mistakes, to be able to look ahead at our future. His love manifested on the cross gives us the power to crush the head of the one who wants us to live our lives in guilt. His love moves us past our past. And this was the message that God was trying to give his people through the prophet Isaiah. When we read our scripture this morning, this was written after the Hebrews had been freed from slavery. They had crossed the Red Sea. They had a civil war. The kingdoms were split into two, the southern and the northern kingdoms. And now both kingdoms were being held in captivity. And in Old Testament times, it was believed that the misfortune, that misfortune was a result of disobedience to God. And all you have to do is look at the book of Job, and you'll see that over and over and over again. Job's friends insisting that he, he needs to repent because he must have done something that brought on uh, God's anger, God's wrath, something that had brought on the misfortune that he was experiencing. Israel believed that they were being punished for their disobedience, their rebellion against God. They believed that they had gone too far that they had rebelled to the point that there was no way that God could ever love them or accept them back, that they had pushed God over the edge. But God, through Isaiah, was attempting to assure them that this was not the case, that he had not given up on them. He was trying to give them a message of hope in these few verses that we read, that they were still loved, that it didn't matter where they had been, it didn't matter what they had done, forget all of that. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past because I'm going to do something brand new. Something new that will deliver you from this circumstance. The problem was, is they were so busy dwelling in the past that
that they were having a difficult time seeing what God had for them right then and there and what he was planning to give them in the future. And I think this happens to us sometimes. We dwell on the past. We live in our regrets. We spend our lives saying, I wish, I wish, I wish, and we miss the opportunities that God is giving us today. We dream about how great it would be to travel back in time and change a decision we made to turn left instead of right, to study for an exam instead of goof off. Some of us may have done things to the point where we felt like there was no way God could ever love us again. No way that God could ever forgive us. No way that he would welcome us back. We may even think that God has left us. That the, the things that we have done was so terrible that God left us. And what happens is when we dwell on the past, we become blinded to the future. We're so busy looking behind us that we aren't looking at what's in front of us. That what God is giving us right here and there. God says, do not dwell on the past. Do not worry about the past. Do not think about the past. I'm doing something brand new. He's far more interested in where you are going rather than where you have been. And if we are unwilling and unable to leave the baggage behind us, we're just going to bring that baggage with us into our new opportunities, into the future. And that baggage is going to contaminate everything that we do. Unless we're willing to let go of the baggage, it doesn't matter where God takes us because we will just contaminate that. We've got to let go of the old and embrace the new. In high school, I don't know if I should share this, but in high school, my school rank was something like 356 out of 380, something like that. Yes, yes, I wasn't last. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. But I assume it wasn't due to a lack of smarts. You know, I was relatively intelligent. But I think it had to do more with motivation. I was more interested in hanging with my friends and being cool and, and doing other things than worry about study. And even in my first semester and only semester of, of community college after high school, even then, I wasn't motivated. I, I got C's and I got D's on my report card. It wasn't until I returned to school in 96 that I really began to apply myself. And of course, I've told the story that my motivation then was God. I was doing this for God now. It wasn't for me. It wasn't for, it was for God. And I got A's and B's all the way, except for maybe a couple classes. I got a C up in chemistry. But even though I was doing well in college, Going through community college, going through University of Illinois, and I was doing well. Even though I was doing well, I still had reservations about seminary. I had fears. I had doubts. Because I kept going back to high school. I kept going back to how I performed in high school. Was I smart enough? Was I good enough? I hadn't let go of my high school grades. And that was causing me to have anxiety about my seminary career. And it wasn't until, you know, everybody was even telling me, you're going to do fine, you'll do fine, you're, you're, you're just turning, you're making a, a little hill in the mountain, you'll, you'll do fine. But it wasn't until I resigned myself fully to Jesus that I found peace. I found peace in his word. I've told that story before where I turned to the scripture, I read a scripture, and it just melted away. It wasn't until I fully trusted in his word that my anxiety disappeared. And I no longer cared because I was doing it for God. And I went to seminary. And I was able to let go of that past, not worry about who I was in high school, and embrace the opportunity that God was giving me at seminary in the future. <coughs> yes, it was going to require driving back and forth to Indianapolis every week for four years, but I knew it this is what God wanted me to do. It was going to happen. And this is a new year. We are beginning a new year, the fourth Sunday of the new year. And God wants to do something new in your life. I don't know what it is. Maybe he's already spoken to you. Maybe he's already been pushing and prodding you and you've just been saying, no, I can't get up an hour early to go to go to Sunday school. I, I, I can't go to Bible study. I can't do this. No, 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 no. 
Well, maybe this is the year where we need to say yes, 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 yes. No matter what mistakes you've made, God is here for you. No matter how many times you followed your own path, God is here for you. And God is ready to begin something new. And my encouragement is to embrace his direction in your life so that your relationship with Christ can be everything that it needs to be. And so this morning I invite you to meditate upon those words and message and song and scripture. And ask yourself, is this the day that I am able? Am I able to be all that God wants me to be? Am I able to step up and follow His direction? Am I able to do all of these things?